Great to see everyone. So my name is Ruth. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And the first thing I want to say is that I'm, as usual, quite ambitious with my presentation. Uh, I always want to give more content that I have time for. Uh, so I thought what I would do today is I have two sets of content. Um, and let's see if we have time to go through both, both sets. If not, then maybe we just do one. Uh, and okay, so starting now, this session is about bio-inspired organizations and sociocracy. My name is Ruth and I'm connected to many different organizations and, and networks. Uh, I have a consulting kind of agency in Brazil called Bioinspiro. And I'm also part of the movement for sociocracy in Brazil. Um, we call ourselves Sociocracia Brasil or sociocracia.org.br. And there are more people in this uh, talk that are also part of Sociocracia Brasil. Um, and today we're going to talk about three main parts of content. The first one is to give a little bit more context to the idea of bio-inspired organizations. And I call it changing our metaphors. The second part is what can biology teach us about organizations? What can we learn specifically about highly collaborative organisms? So what can we learn from super organisms like bees, ants, and even humans? And then how can we integrate some of the principles of healthy living systems or, or healthy ecological um, systems into our organizations. So there are those three parts and then hopefully we'll have some minutes for questions at the end. Uh, I really want to see you people. How can I share my screen and see you people at the same time? I don't know. Okay, so I think I'm going to start with setting the context a little bit. And I think most people in this conversation already know this, but it's this idea that we're living in a VUCA world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I think what I wanted to say about this is that although complexity has been increasing uh, and maybe uncertainty has been increasing too, especially with climate change, same with volatility, the planet in the 3.8 billion years of life on this planet has also had very turbulent times. And I think there are many organisms and many species in the world that have learned how to live in the VUCA world. But for humans, it's something that's very new. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, the idea is how can we learn from the species that have been here the longest and have already figured out how to live in a VUCA world? And I love this quote from Charles Darwin that it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So for us to thrive and survive in a VUCA world, we need to learn how to be responsive to change and how to make our organizations really um, capable of responding. Um, and as I said before, like life on this planet is 3.8 billion years. So we can say we've had 3.8 billion years of research and development, of coming up with really successful strategies, of adapting, of building resilience, and of being able to thrive. And we, in the picture, you see mycelium. Uh, mycelium, they're 500 million years old. We have termites, they're 250 million years old. Like, those species have uh, developed lots of strategies that are actually quite useful for us to use in our organizations. And then I also love this quote from the queen of biomimicry, <coughs> that after 3.8 billion years of research and development, failures are fossils and what surrounds us is the secret to our survival. So let's look to nature to unlock some of the secrets of how we can survive as a human species in a VUCA world. And I think most important, uh, it's the same thing from LALU's reinventing organizations. Like we, to make this evolutionary step, we need to change our metaphors and stop seeing our organizations as machines and start seeing our organizations as living systems, capable of adapting, being really dynamic. And what I want to bring to this conversation, which is also a little bit what we're doing uh, in Brazil, is to add an ethical part that's crucial for our survival, which is the idea of creating regenerative value. So how can we also create organizations that are not just running, not, are not 
not just reinventing themselves or not just running self-management or self-organizations, but actually creating regenerative value. So we take that next step in what I consider to be an, the evolution of organizations. Um, and also something really interesting that living systems is one of the three pillars of sociocracy. So we all, we all know that sociocracy is based on Quakers and a lot of the ideas around consent came from that and engineering and cybernetics and a lot of the ideas about feedback loops and feedback systems also came from engineering and cybernetics, but that's also all grounded in living systems theory that was um, coming up in the 70s. So the idea of taking inspiration from living systems is really at the heart of sociocracy and one of the main pillars. Okay, and then I, I, love, this, I love this question because uh, we, are, we are also part of nature and we've created our own strategies for building resilience and communicating. But how does nature do these things? So how does nature communicate? How does nature build resilience? How does nature manage? What does management and control look like in nature? How does nature spur innovation? And how does nature collaborate? And I think it's from uh, these questions that part of my research comes from and part of my fascination with learning from nature comes from. Okay, am I going too fast? I'm gonna stop uh, sharing screen just so I can see you guys. Okay, am I going too fast or is this easy because it's just, okay, great. So I'm gonna carry on. Um, and a lot of the content uh, that I'm going to, to do today is, is, based on, is based on the research of an evolutionary biologist um, that studied a lot of superorganisms and published a book on how we can embed this wisdom into our, an organiza our organizations. And I'm gonna build the link with sociocracy today. So this is the book I highly recommend it because it's so fun, full of stories about all this incredible diversity that we have on the planet. And it's Dr. Tenzi Willy Barker. Um, yeah, really incredible research. So she figured that superorganisms, and we're talking about um, the idea of su superorganisms are the organisms that almost live as one. So even though you have individual DNA and individual um, elements of uh, a colony, for example, of bees or ants, ultimately they, they work as a team or as a collaborative organism. And she suggests that humans are also a type of super organisms, that we, we've, taken, um, we've taken the DNA of the apes, of the big apes, but the 2% difference between apes and humans is uh, the collaboration and the ability to organize together and the ability to support each other and to care for each other in larger groups, not just a band. Um, and within this idea of humans also maybe becoming super organisms more and more, um, she figured out that there are five main patterns and that is cultivate collective intelligence, nurture swarm creativity, distribute leadership, depend on re reciprocity and sharing, or she also calls it teamwork, and compound regenerative value. Great. So collective intelligence, we all know, we all know about this. this. This is everywhere in sociocracy. And I think all the patterns and the principles that are brought here are so present in sociocracy. So um, there is this idea that superorganisms facilitate self-organized networks. And that's really, that, that's, you can see how that happens in sociocracy where we're facilitating groups or we are enabling groups to self-organize through very clear uh, rules of engagement and through very clear organizational design. And sometimes sociocracy can be adapted for networks and we know it's mainly used for, let's say, a, a more, an ecosystem that has a bigger boundary or has a tighter boundary. Um, but what I've noticing from, from my practice in Brazil is that uh, more and more, especially when we're talking about voluntary groups of people coming together, we need to adapt certain parts of sociocracy so we really works better on, an, on a network level rather than an organizational uh, level with closed boundaries. And we're um, in Brazil, I'm part of a network now 
that we're calling it a community of practice, but it doesn't have such clear boundaries. It's very porous borders where people can come in and out. And we're just um, adapting sociocracy to learn how to best do government uh, governance in these networks. And it's been a fantastic experiment. And it, it's really incredible when you can unlock the power of the collective, of coming together, forming, um, forming teams that then disband, uh, fixing on, uh, now focusing on generating value for the organization that really feels like we're building a little ecosystem. Um, and then I'm also learning a lot from this process. I'm happy to answer more questions about it at the end. Um, anyway, around collective intelligence, I'm not going to go through everything, but one thing that for me is really crucial in sociocracy is number four, the idea of transparency and two-way communication and communication that's always on. And I think through double linking in, in sociocracy, we really managed to capture this idea that we need to ensure flow, flows of information and influence in and out of the circles. Um, in a way that's transparent. And in super organisms, the, this communication many times happen in a chemical level. So um, ants are always putting out pheromones. Uh, bees use communication, use dance as communication. They have seven, 17 different types of ways of dancing to communicate different things. How far the food is, how close it is, how much food there is. Um, what, how, how is it being affected by the weather? There are lots of different things that bees communicate through dance. And the idea that it's always on, um, it's a little bit something like using Slack. Like we, we put the information out there, we make the information transparent, and then teams can use that information as resource to better understand how to evolve their own practices, how to carry out their projects based on the information that's arising from the organization. I also really, really like that. I think it really fits with sociocracy and sociocracy gets inspiration from living systems about how to communicate. And the other thing that I was uh, realizing the other day is number five, when we talk about trigger tipping point decisions with simple rules and feedback loops, I really, this is my dream to explore policy making in sociocracy. In holacracy, you have something called trigger actions that goes a little bit in, in this direction. How can we create policy or agreements that create a cascade of actions where we really don't need to make so many decisions uh, together anymore? It's clear, like we design the algorithms for our organization. We design the, if this happens, then we do this. And we can, um, we can have really clear, clear rules and policies and agreements so we can move more freely within the boundaries set by these algorithms. I'd love to experiment a little bit more with this. Like how can we create policy that makes things much more automated or much easier to make decisions? And a lot of policy is already around this. Um, but I wanted to explore that a little bit more, liking living systems. It's the idea that are very simple rules. And through very simple rules, uh, systems can still self-organize. Like when we have a murmuration of birds, they have only three rules. It's basically all of that movement and complexity arises from just three rules. And for me to be able to really capture the essence of what these rules are in an organization is an art and something that I, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about how, how I can do that. Um, and some of obvious stuff like cultivate diversity and independence. Um, this is also from, from theory on collective wisdom. That, and, and this in sociocracy worries me a little bit that for us to have really good collective wisdom and for collective intelligence to emerge, we need to maintain diversity and independence. And being able to object or hearing all the voices it's, it's a great way of ensuring that we're really getting the collective intelligence. But then what are the, um, how do we, how can we put in, um, I forgot the word I want to use, like safety precautions to make sure that we maintain the diversity and the independence in the group, that we don't have circles that develop such a strong group mind that we lose the diversity and the independence that can emerge through objections. 
Um, and for me, this is also an important concept in sociocracy and something that we need to design into our circles, like how to maintain diversity and independence so that the benefit of, of collective intelligence can really come forth, like it is within most superorganisms in nature, where we have many independent individuals um, carrying, carrying out a lot of independent work um, and maintaining some diversity, especially at an ecosystem level. Uh, and although, yeah, I can go more into that because human action is also reducing the diversity of ecosystems. And I think we do that in our organizations as well. Um, we can really work to reduce diversity. So how do we design in a way to maintain diversity? Uh, this is a quote you can just read. I'm not even gonna go through that. And the idea of swarm creativity. There is also this concept with most of nature and evolution that evolution moves towards a single purpose. And that purpose is to create a better future for the next generations. So almost all species will, will in a way, uh, want to preserve the ability for future generations to live. And this is something that as humans, we're also, we're undoing this innate ability in ourselves of creating a better future for the next generations. We're actually creating a worse future. So how can we create organizations that are, that maintain this core principle of life, that, that one of our roles is to create a better future for, for the future of our species, for our children. Um, and this comes in sociocracy through vision, mission, in holacracy through purpose, in S3 through the driver. How can we create this really compelling shared um, idea of what we want to do together as an organization, but that has this ethic embedded in it, that it's about creating something better for the future generations. I think this is important to to make sure that our organizations are doing that. And this is where the idea of regenerative organizations come as well. How can we not only um, deliver the value that we want to deliver as an organization, but while delivering that value, increasing the capacity of the system to continue delivering value in the future. Um, something else that happens a lot in nature, and, and it's one of the core tenets of evolution and evolutionary design, is the idea of having parallel experiments. And I think this is also so possible within sociocracy, especially with the idea that doing something that's just good enough for now and safe enough for us to try, and embedding this spirit of innovation and this spirit of experimentation in our organizations, having different teams work on the same problem from different angles, um, having the same circle come up with maybe not just one proposal, but three or four proposals of how to tackle a specific tension or a specific uh, driver, um, and then making sure we're collecting enough feedback. So um, yeah, being very experimental, and especially this idea of parallel experiments, I like. I, I don't think we, this is embedded in sociocracy, but I think we can design it in. Uh, I'd like to do the more, that more as well. Um, what's next? Distribute leadership. This is something that in sociocracy is so, such a core part of creating a pathway to distribute authority within an organization that continues to bring clarity to the work that needs to be done, continues to bring transparency to the work that needs to be done, and then continues to bring equality and justice to how the work is distributed in the organization. Um, and, and just like in nature, you know, one of the, the principles of super organisms is that they can create modular teams or specialized teams to uh, when, when there is an opportunity or when there is a threat to be able to deal, to deal with that within their ecosystems. And it's the same in sociocracy. We can start circles, we can uh, be really responsive, create new roles, create new circles, change circles, dissolve circles, create helping circles. There are temporary circles with a very specific fun function. We can totally embed this ecosystemic design as well into our organizations through the governance process of creating circles and roles in sociocracy. And this, this one, I also find it so clear, connect, clearly connected to sociocracy, the idea of distributing leadership 
to integrate local information with global vision. So the idea that we always want to distribute authority and the autonomy for making decisions to the edges of the system, to the groups and the circles and the people that are closest to the action, that have the information with the, um, the finest grain, this doesn't work in English, only in Portuguese, with like, uh, it, it's the, the, the most granular information we can get for making decisions and, and creating a system where authority and autonomy and decision-making, all of those things are kind of the same, can be distributed to the edges where they're closest to the information. And this is exactly how nature operates. Our cells, uh, in our body, we're not, we don't have a brain making decisions about everything that goes on in, goes on in the body. We, we are a distributed system with um, different systems working in a semi-autonomous semi way. And this is also a concept that comes quite strong in S3. It's the idea of semi-autonomous circles. Um, we, in sociocracy, we don't have, we don't have full autonomy we actually have semi-autonomy because it's, it's autonomy that's connected to an overall boundary or that's connected to policy that governs how that autonomy is meant to be carried out. And especially by, it's an autonomy that's also bounded by the interconnection to circles within an organization. And all of this connected to our global vision, all of this connected to a clear sense of purpose. All of this connected to the primary driver of the organization. And to finish this part, which may be all I have time for, is that uh, it's also about collaboration and it's also about sharing wealth and sharing value. And I think this sometimes get, gets missed from the early days of sociocracy and Gerhard Edinburgh, which is the idea of ownership. And a lot of discussions about reinventing organizations don't bring those two items um, to the forefront. One, ownership. Like, how are we going to share the resources, share the profit, share the wealth? Um, and the other is, how are we going to create regenerative wealth? I feel that those two issues are, get uh, often, um, they're missing out of this discussion. And I think they're super important for creating more equality and for also creating more resilience in terms of our capacity to continue living on this planet. So I'd like to see especially those two elements being more embedded in sociocracy and in the organizations that choose to go through this path. Folks, I think that's all I have time for today. Um, I'm just going to briefly show you the rest, but this is going to go on the presentation. And I, I'd love, maybe I can host an open space to discuss this. I've been working on how can we get principles of ecology in a way that makes sense um, as areas of focus that we need to have in an organization that is running sociocracy. So I see sociocracy as the framework or the pathway to make change in an organization. But I, I'd like to see um, I'd like to see specific focus on something that's more connected to ecological principles. So I've, I came up with these five, five main concepts of rhythm, flow, synergy, cycles, and evolution and growth. And, um, and they go through three levels, the individual level, the team level, and the organizational level. So how can we look at rhythm? them for the individual, for the team, for the organization? How can we increase flow or remove blockages to flow at the individual level, the team level, the organizational level? How can we really be aware of cycles that we have in our organization? Interlocking cycles, proposal cycles. How can we improve synergy and mutually beneficial relationships? And how can we deliver a system that's based on qualitative growth? We grow the organization to be more mature, more complex, more sophisticated, and not necessarily quantitative growth on a finite planet that doesn't work. So how can we take these levels, these, these different concepts into our organization through the processes and the framework that's given to us by sociocracy that allows us to really dynamically govern our organization? That's what I have time for. And um, yeah. That's it. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions now.
It's such little time. And that was really fast. So I'll be happy to, uh, to take some questions. There's one question in the chat already, Ruth. Great. So what is still, uh, could you say more about protecting collective value from parasites? Parasites? Yes. <laughs> I think, it, I think it's, it's, about, it's about the idea that uh, it's important to set clear boundaries of the organization and making sure that the people that are delivering value to the organization feel a sense of ownership and they feel that their, their efforts and their work is not being wasted. And this is, this is one of the things that you have in nature. Also, nature creates protection mechanisms and self-regulation mechanisms in order not to lose value. So bees will produce more honey that they need because they know that a bear can come and take some of the honey away. So how can we also create, um, yeah, create some, it's not resilience that is called, what is it called like in, in, in software design, we call it N plus one. I forgot the word. It's not resilient, redundancies, that we can also create some redundancies to protect the value of our organization from being lost. And strategies where, you know, even if we have a big crisis, we can still survive. Thank you. Um, still point as source point. Are you integrating this? Like in the breathing of the year, there are four still points. Yes, this is one of the... <laughs> One of the things that I'm included in the rhythms idea of establishing really this rhythm of the organization and in, in one of the groups that I, that I do, we, we do our cycles through the equinoxes and the solstices. So we, we've managed to design a natural rhythm back into the red natural rhythm of the organization. Yeah, what I also, uh, thank you for that. What I'm also referring to is that when there is a communication going on and one tries to ingest something, that stillness point, the two or the four points, they need to be in our conversation and our decision making, um, sort of having a pause, you know. <laughs> yeah, like so I, uh, that's sort of something I'm, I'm wondering how you, uh, one can work with that more consciously in the uh, sociocratic uh, world. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's important. So, so what I'm suggesting here is that we can integrate all of these more natural patterns into sociocracy just by changing some of the agreements or by changing some of the processes. And I, I think you can just design okay. that into yeah. your decision making that we create more pause or more stillness or... Um, I, I, I also dream of this, uh, well, I'm trying to work with someone in Brazil. I dream of this place where we can make decisions using constellation or systemic exercises, where we maybe, uh, we see consent in the field before we actually present objections. Um, I'm also trying to work with this other yeah, level of good. information. Yeah. yeah. But we, thank, so thank you. is open yeah. for that. That's it. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to know more about that. Thanks. Great. I, I, there, I'm going to put here the work of systemic facilitation from this guy, Boogie Facilitation. Boogie Garcia in, in Spain. It's really beautiful work of bringing these other uh, aspects. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. Why, in your opinion, are super organisms created by simple animals far more intelligent than, than them singularly? Think of ant colony versus ant. And human organizations tend to be more stupid than the single humans that participate into it. That's a very good question. I, th I think because our organizations are not operating with the principles of life. That's the main thing. We, we, are, we are basically... Um, stopping communication flows, blocking creativity, working with, you know, command and control. Hier hierarchy nature is used very rarely um, and only when they need to quickly uh, tone something down or to have just single information going through. Whenever you have just a single point of information, 
it becomes stupid because if there is a mistake in that in that piece of information it can it can really contaminate the whole system so by always creating resilience and redundancies we we eliminate mistakes by having many individuals doing things independently we eliminate we eliminate mistakes yeah maybe that's why so that's what i think we should try to do do more like uh, the super organisms and less like humans I agree that there is no hierarchy of, in the, yes, exactly. We call them nested hierarchies. So one of the core principles of nature is that there are uh, hierarchy of systems or holarchies. And that's, that's also very important. So they, they are, it's a system contained in another system like the Russian doll exercise. And this is very clear in sociocracy as well to me. Anything else? Folks, I love this topic. Anyone that wants to discuss this more, how to bring, uh, yeah, basically how to bring this wisdom that's all around us back into our organizations. And I'm trying now, I, I'm, uh, I have a, I'm really going for it and, and trying out all of this, um, all of this content into one organization together with elements of sociocracy. Yeah. Oh, someone wants to discuss it more. Yeah, where can we see more of your work? So w the other thing I wanted to, it's, it's all very new. It's something that's being developed. I really recommend reading Teaming, the book. Um, and um, I'm going, yeah, I'm in Europe more. I'm moving back to Europe. So I'm hoping to be able to do more consultancy in Europe and more, more training in Europe around the idea of bio-inspired organizations. In Brazil, we have a consultancy called bio but we haven't been creating a lot of content because it, it's something that we're still, we are, in, we are in the process of formulating it. Yeah. But I'm going to send, I'm going to send the presentation that has what we have so far. Thank you.